RK. All right. Well, I'm Larry Scogan. It's my good fortune to be the president of Bismarck Art State College, and I certainly want to welcome you this afternoon. What a beautiful afternoon we're having. And, you know, I'm, I'm continuously amazed at how many of you will take such a beautiful day like this to come up and listen to a couple knuckleheads talking to each other here. So we really do appreciate it. Uh, it is unbelievable. This is our sixth year of doing this. And uh, it has just been a great, great part of our life, our friendship, and, and, and a growing part of the community and, and of Bismarck State College. And so I'm delighted to have all of you here. Uh, normally, I would uh, go through this real long introduction of Clay Jenkinson because his, uh, his resume is so long and illustrious and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and uh, so he just told me, he says, let's keep it short. So please welcome Clay Jenkinson Thank to our Thank you. Perfect. Huh? Perfect. Perfect. Did it. And, you know, we're, we're streaming live, live again. So if you go to BSC Talk, we actually, these are recorded, but they're also streamed. And, and my mm -hmm. daughter called me about an hour ago and said if she had nothing else to do in New York City <laughs> of any sort, she might tune in. She's studying Greek mythology today. Okay. And so I said I would say hello to her. So well, I'll say great. hello to her. Yeah, well, I, I just did. Yeah, you just did? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've had a great summer, I trust? I, I have. Well, first let me do some administrative stuff. It's Please. just a requirement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to begin with, this is our sixth season, and if you did not pick up one of these on your way in, please pick one up. It shows you everything else that we're going to be doing this season. Um, our very next one, we might, we'll talk a little bit more about it here because that's the first picture that's up here, so we'll talk about that. But what's really important for us is this white sheet that has an evaluation on there. If you would take the time to do that, uh, we really want to hear your ideas about what you like about the program, what you don't like about the program, if you've got any thoughts about some topic you want us to cover. Um, we've got the whole thing. And it also helps us track where you heard about the, this so that we can direct more resources to whatever it might be uh, that you're finding out about us. So we appreciate that very much. So uh, please do that. And, uh, and Kayla and Lori are here someplace. They're over here. And they will collect them at the end. And then at the end of our programming as well, we're talking about documentary films today. And so at the end of our program, Clay is going to be right out front here. Um, David Borlaug brought some of the uh, films down. And maybe at the end, he'll tell you what he's got if you're interested in picking any of those up, and, and we can do that after we're all done. But that's true. So. The, so we make these documentary films, and they're made under the auspices of the Lewis and Clark Fort Mandan Foundation through the Dakota Institute, and David is here. And I just want to make sure everyone is aware that next weekend, a week from yesterday, is the grand reopening of the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center up at Washburn. And you probably know that we've had a huge and impressive expansion that David has been seeing through now for more than a year. And it'll be Saturday and Sunday, but the official ribbon cutting of the expansion, which is really, really remarkable, is at 10 a.m. on Saturday at Fort Mandan, right off 83. But then all of Saturday and all of Sunday, there is music, programming, uh, tours of the, of, the, of the new exhibits and so on. Chuck Suki will be playing on Saturday. Um, and um, Cottonwood will be playing on Sunday, and Beverly Everett, who's here today, and several others will be uh, making music too. That's correct, right? So Saturday, Chuck Suki, Sunday, Cottonwood, and Dr. Everett, plus mm -hmm. others. But it's really worth coming up and seeing. You know, if you, most of you have been to Fort Mandan at one time or another, and you may think, I've done that, but it's a whole new, it's a whole new world up there. What David did was to sort of rethink the Lewis and Clark story in the context of the Enlightenment and, and the work of Thomas Jefferson and the vision of Thomas Jefferson. And it's really a remarkable remake. And it's a different story from the one you thought, we all thought we knew about the 146 days that Lewis and Clark spent in North Dakota in 1804 and 1805, so. Wonderful, good. And as long as we're making announcements, uh, if you did not, or there should be some of these at your table. We're really excited in November, uh, November uh, 5th through 7th, we're going to be hosting a JFK symposium right here in this very room. And it's really exciting. Uh, Clint Hill, the guy, as we all know, that climbs on the back of the limousine after the president has been shot and Mrs. Kennedy is on the trunk of the limousine. 
Uh, Clint Hill's actually from Washburn. Many of you probably knew that. Anyway, he's coming back, and he's going to be our, co our keynote speaker on the evening of the 5th of November. And then he's also doing a presentation again on a second book he's got coming out, and he'll be doing that on the morning of the 6th. So we're very excited about that. As well, uh, Dr. Senator Harrison Jack Schmidt from the state of New Mexico, who was one of the last two men to stand on the moon. He was on the very last mission to the moon. And, uh, you know, there were only 12 men that actually stood on the moon, and I think they're down to about nine of them left right now. And, uh, but Jack Schmidt will be right here uh, talking to us, uh, uh, talking about JFK and the space program. It's going to be very exciting. And I'm so excited that uh, Senator Schmidt is coming to town. He really wants to interact with students, and so in addition to being part of the symposium, he's also going to be given a presentation at Bismarck Public Schools, and he's given a presentation over at Sidney J. Lee Auditorium for the students, and, and, and he asked for this, which is really neat. He said, well, if I'm coming to your college, I want to talk to students, and if you've got area high school students, I want to talk to them too. Because he's really trying to, you know, for those of us who were around in the 60s and 70s, remember how exciting the space program was, and, you know, that's really sort of run its course, and, and uh, Senator Schmidt is one of those that's really trying to get people excited about manned flight into space again. He was the first... So bonafide scientist on the moon. Only bonafide scientist. There was, there was a lot of reluctance to put a civilian uh, into the Apollo system, and, but pressure from the international science community to, to be serious about science, particularly in this case geology. There was a huge contest about whether he should fly, and he did, and, and he, he did. became the second last person ever, ever to stand on the on surface of the moon. And yeah. it won't be, I think, during our, our lifetime. Again. Now, one more announcement. Okay. Um, the Dakota Institute at the Lewis and Clark Fort Mandan Foundation publishes books. And as I understand it, you have a brother. I do. Who lives in Los Angeles or nearby. And he has written a book, which we have now published. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it's a beautiful book. It's out in front. Uh, it, it, nothing else. Just stop by to take a look at it. My, my brother spent a year in Vietnam as uh, in the criminal investigation division. And and at that time, 71, 72, of course, the big issue was narcotics. And so he spent almost an entire year in criminal investigations, most of it having to do with, with uh, drug offenses and the results of, uh, uh, of illicit drug use. And he has a marvelous story to tell, and uh, the Dakota Institute decided to publish it, and it turned out to be a marvelous book. And, uh, and you, you played a little role in it in yeah. that your brother had that year in Vietnam, and he's, it's quite a controversial book. It's going to be. It was one of the <laughs> best years of his life, and yet he has very strong opinions about the Vietnam Veterans Wall and PTSD and so on. But he came back and told all these stories, and you then helped to investigate them, did you not? Well, most memoirs are exactly that. It's people kind of remembering things and jotting them down. And so what I did uh, with my brother Gary is uh, w we went through a process of him telling me these stories, and then I went to the next, because I've got a PhD in history, and this is what historians actually do, <laughs> is go to archives and dig around in the documents. And so I went to the National Archives and dug around the documents, and lo and behold, I found the police reports that he'd filed, and I found the police blotters for his time in Vietnam, and and just found a number of reports, so we took that and put it together with his remembrances and ended up with a pretty good story. And that yeah, book is fun. really just literally out for one week, and the book launch will be in Bismarck sometime this fall. Yeah. And then okay. finally, about the JFK Symposium, uh, Dr. Everett's here, but there's going to be a performance right in this room of the Bismarck Mandan Symphony, a special Kennedy-related A peace commission just for the symposium. Mm -hmm. I Speak of Peace, I think is the name of it. And so we're very excited. It'll be played for the first time right here during the symposium. So, okay, that's 10 minutes worth of announcements. That we it beats the introductions, did. though. Yeah, it does. So okay. here's... I, so now we're going to have yeah. documentary filmmaking. So, so this is the next one. Uh, but first... Oh, I know what you're going to talk our about. Our hike. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy um, found a document... It was 1963, in a book in which Theodore Roosevelt 
uh, who had been president between 1901 and 1909, had issued an executive order requiring officers of the Marine Corps to walk 50 miles in 20 hours in under three days. So they could do it in one day, two days, or three days. But they, his executive order was that they must walk 50 miles in under 20 hours spread over what could be as many as three days. And when John Kenton, as you probably remember, if I got some slides here, but um, here's, here's Kennedy at the height of his presidency. He, as you probably remember, there was a physical fitness mania that was set off by the Kennedy administration in response to the Sputnik and the perceived Soviet lead in the Olympics and in another um, arenas of competition. And so President Kennedy wrote an article in Sports Illustrated saying that we were becoming a slovenly nation, that we needed to get up out of our chairs and get exercise. And so when Kennedy came across this document, he decided that he would challenge his Marine Corps commandant, a man named General Shoup, to do the same thing, to get Marine officers in 1963 to walk 50 miles in a similar amount of time. And maybe some of you remember this. It became a kind of national fad. It wasn't just military people, but it was a fad that took off all over the country. And we heard a little bit this weekend, perhaps even here in North Dakota, although it was midwinter. Boy Scouts around the country did this. Um, students at Marin County High School in north of San Francisco, 400 of them started, 97 finished. But it became sort of a national craze. And the first person to do it was Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General of the United States, the younger brother of JFK. And he, on February 9th, 1963, walked on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal along the Potomac River 50 miles in a single day in 17 hours. In, in his dress shoes. In his dress shoes. <laughs> when it was slushy and snowy. So think of this, 17 hours and 52 minutes, I think, on a single Saturday, February 9th, 1963, wearing dress shoes with three aides. He took three aides along with him, people who worked for him in the Justice Department, and he completed it in a single day. The last of his three aides dropped out at mile 36, but Kennedy finished. And when his aide dropped out at mile 36, Robert Kennedy said, you're lucky your brother's not the president of the United States. <laughs> and so he finished. And here's Roosevelt, who also um, didn't do a 50-mile hug, but he did a 100-mile horseback ride to show that it could be done. Here's Robert Kennedy <laughs> at the end of the hike. This is Ethel Kennedy rubbing the Attorney General's feet. He, he hiked from Georgetown to Camp David. And this is Life magazine tailed along and did a photo essay on the, the Attorney General. And this is Ethel Kennedy rubbing the Attorney General's feet. Here he is. This, these are bad photographs. I'm, I apologize for them. Here he is walking along the canal. And here he had a Newfoundland dog named Brumus. Here he is with Brumus, wishing he were not hiking the <laughs> Chesapeake and Ohio. But this was this photo spread. And so I don't know who did it, Larry, but you and I have a couple of friends who go on little mini adventures together. And somebody suggested that we do this 50 mile hike. That because, would be you. Because it's the 50th anniversary the of the 50 mile hike. And so. Tell us a little bit about that. No, oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. You're doing fine. <laughs> it was your idea. So I thought, <laughs> because there's this, this elasticity, it doesn't have to be in a single day. I knew that would be the end of several important friendships. <laughs> but I thought, what if we did it over two days, and we started in Bismarck, and we hiked south of Mandan along the trail, the Rough Rider Trail, that winds up at Fort Rice, which is 27.5 miles south of Mandan. And you and two of our good friends, on Friday morning, the Friday just passed, met in the parking lot at Dan Super Value in Mandan, and we did it. We hiked all day Friday, and then we had, we had staged cars with drinks and narcotics. 
This was a gentleman's hike. Power you know, bars cars and so on, lined sandwiches. Up. Yep. Yep. But we did, all four of us, make it from Dan's Super Value in South Mandan to Fort Rice, where we had a splendid evening, right? Yep. You with yep. me so far? So far. Yep. I've never prayed so hard in my life for rain the next day. Here, the, here we are. Here, this is, yep. I'm taking the picture, but there you are yep. with two others, Dan Super Value, 7 a.m., sun has just arisen. Now, this is a very interesting historical photograph <laughs> because this is one of the hikers presenting you with this object, right? And I provided a cut line. Larry, this is what's known as a sleeping bag. I believe I've heard you say that you would never sleep outside again in your life. And I know why now. <laughs> I know why. But you did. I did, yep. And so this is what I looked like last <laughs> night. What happened was that, go back to a more happy photograph, but what happened was that, as you probably remember, the weather yesterday was not ideal. And so we got out to... Fort Rice and had this splendid evening, beef steaks and fried potatoes and salad and so on, great wine. And then you had pressing duties back in civilization, and so, and, and so did one other. So two of us started out yesterday morning from Fort Rice to come all the way back to honor Robert Kennedy, and the, the rain became so appalling that we came in. That left... 14 miles unfinished. So, failure. So then, to make matters worse, I, when I got home, I changed clothes and took a, a hot shower for an hour and 17 minutes. <laughs> and then I walked the last 14 miles. So I finished last night, and yep, when I yep. finished, I was, this is how I looked. <laughs> no, and, and so did one other. One, one other person independently finished the 50-mile yep. hike. Yep. It is no fun, and you will, I think you will attest that there's some wear and tear on a body. Yeah. Clay was being very kind. I, I had nothing pressing to come back oh, to. Oh, please. You said you I, had a root canal. No. <laughs> I would have preferred a root canal. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I was wearing down quickly, but, it, uh, but I made it 27 and a half miles. I was delighted with that. And, and as soon as I saw one drop of rain, I decided you were done. that I am done. I'm not going to walk in the rain. But, so I figure within the next six months, I just have to do 23 miles. Mile a day. Yep, that's right. So anyway, that was, but that was in honor of this, this event. that President Roosevelt insisted that his Marines do 50. Then John Kennedy insisted that his Marines do 50. And this thing is being recreated all over the country this fall, yep. especially in... Kennedy country in Massachusetts and Maryland and Virginia, but we, I think, are the only North Dakotans to do this. And now we know why. Yeah. Now we know why. So, speaking of which, we, have, we haven't been here for months. I, I want to know how you spent your summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're the acting chancellor of higher ed. I am. Let's go on. That, no, but that's, that's cute. That's cute. I, I, w I wanted to buy you the helmet. <laughs> but no, really. So, I mean, how, how has it been? Just quickly tell us. Well, no, uh, you know, um, we, higher education has, has been in some turmoil. I think everybody agrees with that. And, and so the, the board uh, asked the chancellor, the, my predecessor, to leave and, and uh, selected me on the uh, June 24th or 25th meeting to, to be acting chancellor. And, and I've been doing it. I'm delighted to work for North Dakota and North Dakotans. And so we've been working through a process. And then, um, I, but I've been dual hatted, which means I've still been doing BSC stuff and, and uh, university system stuff. And so things have been going well. And now they're going to narrow it down. They've narrowed it down. To you two are now. one of two candidates for yeah. the, not permanent, Same. but the interim chancellor. Interim chancellor that will take the university system through the election in November of 2014 and then through the next legislative session. Uh, and then if, if the state board remains and the chancellor's office remains intact, then they will do a national search and have somebody in the summer of 2015 start as chancellor. But you're actually doing both things. You're right presiding now. over this college 
yeah. and you're the acting yeah. chancellor. You know, the, the Bismarck State is such a strong institution that I've said that the, the worst that can happen out of this is they find out at BSC they really don't need me. <laughs> that when I'm gone, they're going to go, well, what did he was do? he missing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, so I think it's going really well. We've got a very strong team here, and we've worked on a lot of issues, and we'll, we'll move. Let, let's move on. It, it's going to work out fine. But whatever happens in the next couple of weeks, we thank you for your service at oh. a time of difficulty in the state of North Dakota. It can't be joy to take on that role, and you've done it with great panache and professionalism, so thanks thank for that. We, really, well, we all really appreciate it. I appreciate that. So, it's a... So here's how I spent my summer vacation. I was off in Idaho and Montana on a big, big you know, Lewis and Clark trip, and this is the Missoula fire. And this is, this is just, this is where Traveler's Rest is. And Lewis and Clark came back in 186, and they stopped just on this side of the Rocky Mountains at a place they called Traveler's Rest, and it was burning, and so we actually couldn't get back mm. from Idaho into Montana because it was, uh, the wildfires were so bad. Let's talk about documentary films, should we? I think that's a great idea. <clears throat> Go ahead. Well, how did you get into documentary films? What, what, what's the purpose, what's the philosophy behind doing a documentary film? As opposed, you've written books, and as opposed to writing a book, why would you want to do a film, and how did you get started and all that? Well, uh, when I moved back to North Dakota, I think eight years ago, uh, I started working with David Borlaug, and we decided we wanted to create a Dakota Institute you were part of those deliberations, and we would have a press. Your brother's book is one of the products of that press. And we would do symposia, like the 9-11 symposium we did, the Eric Severide symposium we did, several on uh, Maximilian and Baudmer, who were explorers in the 1830s, and then coming up, the JFK symposium, and, and you're a, a formal co-sponsor of that. But we also wanted to do some documentary films. Why? Because it's fun. But it's also important. I mean, today, more people access information through media than they do through books. Um, people still read. This is, you know, reports of the death of the, of the book are greatly exaggerated. But more and more, people are getting their history through multimedia, as you know. So we decided to produce some documentary films. And the first one was on Art Link, former North Dakota governor. When I first came back, Art Link was in his early 90s. And uh, his health wasn't great, but I had always, you know, tremendously admired him. He had been the governor of North Dakota when I was graduating from high school. And, you know, whatever your politics, I had just seen him as this extraordinary representative of, a, of North Dakota's agrarian heritage. And so I approached him at a Lewis Clark Fort Mandan annual banquet and said, you know, Governor Link, I'd like to sit down with you and talk about the possibility of creating a documentary film. And he was really not in favor of it because he was so amazingly modest. And he said, why would anyone want to know about me? And we eventually talked him into it, and we produced that film. And I thought we would just show a couple of clips of it and then talk about the process. Okay. This is, we've made three documentary films so far. The Art Link film, then one on former North Dakota Governor Bill Guy, and most recently a film about Harold and Shyla Schaefer called Mr. Bubble, the Harold Schaefer story, which was just released in June, and, and its formal launch, its public events, will be this fall in Bismarck and in Fargo. But I thought we'd look at, if it's all right, at a couple of clips, okay. and then we can talk about the process. Yep. Is that all right? Yep. So, Dusty, would you play <clears throat> Art Link clip one? When the landscape is quiet again, Governor Arthur A. Link, October 11th, 1973. We do not want to halt progress. We do not plan to be selfish and say North Dakota will not share its energy resources. We simply want to ensure the most efficient and environmentally sound method of utilizing our precious coal and water resources for the benefit of the broadest number of people possible. 
And when we are through with that, and the landscape is quiet again, when the drag lines, the blasting rigs, the power shovels, and the huge gondolas cease to rip and roar, and when the last bulldozer has pushed the last spoil pile into place, and the last patch of barren earth has been seeded to grass or grain. Let those who follow and repopulate the land be able to say, our grandparents did their job well. The land is as good and in some cases better than before. Only if they can say this, will we be worthy of the rich heritage of our land and its resources. So just stopping there. How did you get Garrison Keillor? Well, we were making the film, and the film centered around this speech that Art Link gave in October of 1973 in Mandan. And he had gone to Mandan to do a traditional talk at a REC annual meeting, a banquet, lunch banquet, and he, he had a speech about caution and not making rash decisions about energy development. But as he sat there waiting to be introduced, he realized that it didn't really say what he wanted to say. And so Art Link took out of his pocket a pen and he wrote in the margins of the speech what he really wanted to say, which was this. And he delivered that speech. So it was written on the spot, literally, minutes before he was introduced. And so I had, I had heard about this speech all my life, but I had, didn't know much about it. And so when we began to work on the film, we found it, of course. And then we had Art Link say it, and other people quoted in the film. But then I thought, as we were getting towards the end of it, wouldn't it be great if Garrison Keillor would be willing to voice that speech. And so I know him a little, and I wrote to him and asked him, and, and he, he agreed. And so he recorded it in his St. Paul studio and sent it to us. And, and this is the opening of the film, and so I wanted people to be watching it and kind of listening and then realizing, oh, that's Garrison Keillor. And when they realized that they would think, it would, it would give depth and authority and something special to the speech that would make people then listen more carefully through the course of the film when that speech was talked about. And so, I mean, this was a long shot. I did not expect him to say yes, but he did. And, and so, and he, and he read it beautifully. And so then we thought, we won't distract, we won't show him. So let me, just, let me just try to back up just a little. When you make a documentary film, and I'm just an amateur at it, I'm not an expert, but when you make a documentary film, there's so many things you have to think about. There is, you have an hour in this case. So the first thing you think is, well, what's the story I'm going to tell? Am I going to tell the story of Art Link's life from birth until death? Am I going to emphasize the governorship? Um, will it be personal or public? Will it be friendly or hostile or mixed? So you have to develop the story you're going to tell. And, and I always wait and let the, this will sound a little new agey, but I wait and let the story tell me the story it wants to tell. And so, so then when you, when you get to that point, then you start to sort of assemble an outline for the film. And so all these things have to come into place. So in, in, a, in any given film, let's, let's take the Schaefer film that we just finished. We spent two and a half years on it. I probably, I did all the interviews myself. We probably interviewed 30 people. We interviewed you for a couple of hours. We interviewed Randy Hudson Bueller for a couple of hours. We interviewed Ed Schaefer, the former governor of North Dakota, for six hours. Uh, we interviewed a whole range of people, but nobody for less than half an hour, and often an hour, two hours, three hours. And so now you have Shyla Schaefer, who's here, interviewed for many, many hours, dozens of hours, over a, a couple of year period. And so eventually then you have this, this gigantic archive of material. And 
you then go through it and you decide what you can use and what you can't use. And it's really complex because you can't always use what you want to use. When I've, I've had the good fortune to be in a couple of Ken Burns films, you know, he's America's great document, documentary filmmaker, and when I've, I've been in three of his films now, the, the third will be coming out in January, it's on the Roosevelt's, and when I sat down to be interviewed with him the second time, he said, I'll tell you what, you can talk all you want, but I can only use what you make usable. In other words, if you just blather on, I might not be able to cut out a usable bite, but if you speak in discrete little modules with complete sentences and end in a way that ends whatever it is you're trying to say, it's much more likely that I can use what you said. And, the, and he used a, a metaphor from gymnastics. He said, you have to stick the landing. You know, so you're say, let's say you're saying that Thomas Jefferson was the greatest man who ever lived. You need to end it by saying, and therefore, Thomas Jefferson was the greatest man who ever lived so that when he comes in to edit that film, he can go slice that out and it's not a, you're not going on with the next sentence already or pausing or stammering or whatever. And so out of the 75 hours of Schaefer film material, there might be hundreds of things I would like to use, but you can't use because they weren't said in a usable way. That's very frustrating, mm -hmm. but that's just the nature of it. And Someone like Ken Burns might say to you, Larry, say it again, and this time say it this way. But I don't like to do that because that feels a little forced. And so that's one thing. The second thing is that there is an enormous pressure. You need to tell so many stories in an hour that you can't spend much time on any given piece. And so I might interview you about, let's say, the Sand Creek Massacre or the massacre at Wounded Knee, and you might be brilliant and insightful and wise for an hour and a half, and it turns out that's only a two-minute episode in the film, now I not only have to throw most of that away, but I have to find that which you said, which covers the ground, too. And you, you can tell the story. When we were working on the Bill Guy film, I wanted to, to talk about the time that the ship that he was on almost sank. <laughs> the USS Iowa that was carrying the President of the United States to Tehran. So FDR, in the middle of the war, is going to Tehran to meet with Stalin and Churchill, and the ship that Navy officer Bill Guy was on accidentally shot a torpedo at the USS at the Iowa, ship. Where, yes. on which was FDR. <laughs> Imagine. And they so were all you, arrested, if I remember. They were all, uh, <laughs> terrible things happened, but Bill, Bill Guy did not suffer for it, but that ship was never trusted again, yeah. and people's careers were broken over that. So you pick it up from there. So you said, hey, I think I might be able to help you. Well, so what I did is contacted people at the military academy in, at Colorado Springs, and they had an Air Force, or excuse me, a Navy officer that was willing to talk about this. He was a historian of this, He yeah. was a historian. He, and so we went down to the Air Force Academy and set up, had a little location they gave us, and you must have interviewed him for an hour and a half. It was great stuff that he gave you. He was, he was terrific. And none of it got into the film. And so after all that, after spending a couple of thousand dollars and a couple of days of our time and this wonderful interview about this really essential story, by the time when, you're, when, when you finish a film, you've got, it has to be an hour and you have an, an hour and 42 minutes of film. You know, you assemble the chapters and the episodes you want to and then you see how long it is and it's an hour and 42 minutes. And at some point, David Borlaug or Prairie Public Television says, sorry, you have to cut 42 minutes out of it. And so then you go in and you start by cutting fat, but eventually you start to cut muscle and in the end you cut bone. And so we had had this wonderful experience at the academy and we weren't able to use any of it. And that happens. I mean, I've interviewed you yeah. three or four times and most of what you say, I'm just it's sitting there, can't use that, can't <laughs> use that, can't. Yeah. But, but the, you yeah. know, then we get to the point yeah. we can use and it's 17 minutes and we're gonna use two minutes. So how do you make that decision? Are, are you agenda driven? Like for example, the landscape is quiet, it really has an agenda to it, I think. What's that? Analysis, right? What is it? I mean, it's an awareness of, of that sort of uh, um, environmentalism that Art Link represented. 
Well, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't put it exactly that way because then we made the Bill Guy film and Bill Guy was very different from Art Link. Bill Guy was, well, Daryl Dorgan, one of the talking heads in that film, says Bill Guy set the table for the economic feast that we're all now enjoying. And so that film appears to be very pro-development because Bill Guy was a pro-development, economic development sort of governor. Mm -hmm. We didn't distort the image. We just told the story that needed to be told. The reason we used that speech in this film is because Art Link really did something, if you think about it, did something incredibly courageous, whether you agree with what he did or not. At that time, if you're old enough to remember, there was a plan to build 22 coal-fired gasification plants in North Dakota. There were going to be coal slurry pipelines that took coal slurry to Arkansas and to Louisiana. They were going to build coal-fired power plants all over the state. I mean, this was a gigantic um, coal boom. And the governor at the time was Art Link, and he, he didn't, didn't think that was a good idea. And so he decided to risk his career by saying, no, we're not going to do it as fast as they want or as much as they want. The term he liked to use was, we're going to go slow. And then when he was shopping around for a phrase to sort of appeal to the people of North Dakota, he came up with the phrase, one-time harvest, and said, we're a farm state. We're an agrarian people. We're not going to have a one-time harvest. And that phrase really got under the skin of the people of North Dakota and really changed the way they thought about this. And then he gave this speech. So I think that you couldn't tell this story without talking about that. that and I don't mean this in a negative way, but... I think we just lost you. I don't, I don't mean this at all as, as a negative thing to say, but Art Link's career as governor would not be that interesting were it not for this episode. Most governors shake a lot of hands, sign a lot of bills, cut ribbons. That's what governors do. We have a, in North Dakota, we have a constitutionally weak governorship. The governor is not a very powerful constitutional figure in North Dakota life. As you know, the legislature is powerful. And so he probably wouldn't have merited a documentary film if it hadn't been for this dramatic thing that happened okay. in the middle of his life. And so, there's no agenda to the film. It, 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 I do, I'm a huge admirer of Governor Link, but when we came to Bill Guy, some people that I work closely with said, well, we're not so fond of his pro-development views, and I thought, that's none of our business. We're producing a documentary film. You have to tell the story the way it needs to be told, and that's the story of development. Okay. So it varies. Okay. But, so that, anyway, so that's that little episode. Okay. If, you, if it's okay, I'll just move yeah, to the second clip. Yeah, let's keep going here. So this next clip is about talking heads. And you've been a great talking head in these films because you're a historian, you know how it works, you're media savvy. I, wish, I was going to bring some outtakes, uh, but it just, not of you, but of, of from the films <laughs> we've made. Yeah. But it I'll just, no, but I wanted to look at what actually gets into a film. And so... Now this next piece is, I think it's called A Little Suspicious. It's from this film, and if you remember Art Link, um, there were all these legends around him that he changed his own oil in his car in Washington, D.C., and so on. And so the reason I want it, well, we'll talk about it when we've, when we've shown the clip, but two things. One is, if you, if you interview people enough, they start to, without knowing it, talk to each other. So two people that you interview a month apart who've never met each other, wind up talking to each other because they're talking about the same theme. And secondly, the advantage of having a really, really, really brilliant talking head. And in this case, it's Mike Jacobs of the Grand Forks Herald, one of my oldest friends. And he is about as good a go-to guy as you can ever get. And he says something in this next clip that is so perfect that it sort of became the theme of the film. So, Dusty, if you'd show this clip. These stories are widely reported, but they almost seem too good to be true. He so represents what we thought we were. And so we just grasped onto it. I don't know to what extent Link was personally conscious of this capacity of his, but 
you know, I, I'm a little suspicious because of the enduring quality of, the, of these things. I mean, they, they, keep, they keep cropping up. And because some of them seem strangely manufactured. I mean, I mean, if you're a congressman from North Dakota, after all, don't you think it would make a great story to change the oil on your vehicle on the street in Washington? <laughs> you, don't you think that that would be worth a vote or two? He, he actually uh, changed the oil on his vehicle in the parking lot, Farmers Union Oil. He'd put on his coveralls and go out in D.C. where they had their apartment, and he'd change his oil out there. Because I wasn't aware that he changed his own oil. Now, uh, you know, driving, driving the number five car, you know, that was his favorite car, and he had a sentimental value to that car, you know, that old Chevy that he had there. But I, I don't think that there was much that Dad did for the purpose of endearing himself to the electorate. You know, you got to understand where he came from. His father was an immigrant. They settled in some of the worst dirt in North Dakota. And he came from hard scrabble roots. And to get where he got to um, was, a, was a pretty uh, incredible climb. And, and an ordinary man doesn't make that climb. It takes something. It takes, some, it takes more than ambition. It takes talent. Um, it takes thoughtfulness. Um, he, and he, it, it takes the ability to really believe that you can make a difference. Art always believed he could make a difference. I, I, I know that about him. He always believed he could make a difference. And so if that's ambition, that's ambition. I mean, obviously, every politician seeks acceptance. I mean, uh, most people seek acceptance uh, on that. But I don't think that he ever... Uh, did it to manipulate or 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 to do that, and and so uh, so I, I I was just kind of the way Dad was. He was quite the politician. <laughs> I just it's hard to see Art Link as a calculating individual, uh, but when you see these stories and you know these these sorts of myths that have accrued to him, you have to wonder whether he didn't understand that he had this capacity. And, and to use it to his advantage. I believe that. <laughs> well, is it true that you changed your own oil in Washington, D.C.? No. <laughs> he might have swam the creek, though. So there you see different talking heads. Yeah. And then at the end of the film, and we may get to see this little piece, at the end of the very end of the film, we have sort of outtakes. And Art Link says, you know, Maybe I did change the oil in my car. Because he even he Art Link that. is caught up in the Art Link myth. But, but, I, but it, it, it passed very quickly. But if you heard Mike Jacobs, and so he's the contrarian in the film, he's, which is a role that he likes, as you know. And he's sort of skeptical, but he, but he loves Art Link. I can tell you from a long history with Mike that Art Link is one of his national heroes. But he's the contrarian, saying, so, eh, it seems a little calculated, but if you heard his first statement, it's just world class, he said of Art Link. He so represented what we thought we were. In other words, he didn't necessarily represent what we were, but he so represented what we thought we were. And so the calling us to this agrarian stewardship yeah. model is what Art Link did, and it worked. You know, whether it would, would work in 2013 is a very different sort of question, whether he would have traction today. But it worked then, one-time harvest, and when the landscape is quiet again. Those, those got through the noise of the oil boom, or the coal boom, and spoke to the heart of the North Dakota character. And the people of North Dakota sort of said, you know, I think he's right. I think we should slow this thing down a little. And so he was a man of that time. Mm -hmm. It was brilliant, so, okay. Well, uh, I think we want to dig into this a little bit, but, but let's keep moving let's here. Let's look at one so more, we can get to the Harold one more Schaefer piece here, story. yeah, yeah. Where the sky is high as heaven And easily some are lost Without clear direction Heedful of the cost Born by those whose shadows 
to earth have yet to fall Yields the land, wielding hand Father for us all With the heart of a dreamer Eyes keen for truth Aging wise redeemer Perpetuating youth Tempered in the spirit By the lone coyote's call Yields a land Wielding hand Father for us all Steady as she goes That winds through the tall grass Tomorrow gladly knows Winds through the tall grass Tomorrow Father for us all, brother in the soul, mothering in toil, Father for us Thomas Jefferson's most famous pronouncement was, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. That has been the creed of Arthur A. Link and the chosen people who live out where the landscape is quiet. Life is too short. I'm at the end of it, and I can't believe it. I got, this is you got many, many things, things you want to do yet. That we can't go to, we won't be able to. If you had 50 more years, how would you spend them? You know, I haven't, I haven't uh, gone into that. It's just the fact, well, one of the, one of the things is to clean up the garage. <laughs> What I know is that he was being interviewed by a reporter from the Fargo Forum, and Art was notorious for staying up all night long and nodding off in his office. And then in the middle of a very long question from a pretty snooty reporter, Art just nodded off in the middle of the question. And the reporter sat there and waited. And Art didn't wake up, so the reporter left. <laughs> he would always want to stop on the way back to Bismarck at around midnight to have breakfast. You know, it's only midnight, and Art Link says, no, we've got to stop at the truck stop here at Sterling and have breakfast. And you think, oh, not again. <laughs> but we stopped. Another thing I remember is he never wanted to go more than 55 miles an hour. And of course, I was young, <laughs> I was impatient, wanting to get someplace quickly. But it was very clear we were not going more than 55 miles an hour. My, my uh, picture memory of him is eating his eggs and his toast and taking his toast at the end of his fork and scraping every bit of moisture left from the egg yolk on his plate so that when his plate was clean, it was dishwasher clean. <laughs> That's what I remember about the value system of Art Link eating breakfast. But Art is not a man to waste money. Not his own money, not the people's money, not anybody's money. Uh, Art Link is famously tight with a buck. You know, and he basically changed the oil on the street in Washington. You know, crawled under the car, took out the plug, <laughs> you drained the oil. Uh, and all the while, talking to somebody from back home. I don't remember doing it. I maybe I did it. Maybe I did it.
And Will Rogers said, take care of the land, boys. They ain't making any more of it. I believe that. It's a tribute film, certainly. It's not meant to be a hard-hitting analytical film about the life and work of Art Link. It's a tribute to him, which we're very happy to do. I, I mean, I'll freely admit that bias. That, and so was the Bill Guy film, a tribute to Bill Guy, and, uh, who is even a more important figure, I think, in North Dakota history. And the film about Harold Schaefer was a tribute to him. We're not in the business of making investigative reporting. And These trying, are not exposés. No, no, they're, they're meant to be generous and appreciative, but historically accurate and thoughtful, I hope. But they're, this, this is, I, I haven't watched it for several years. It's certainly, if you have Chuck Suki singing a song called Father to Us All, th th that's a tribute film. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Are we getting to the... All right, so should we... Yeah, let's keep moving. All right, let's keep moving. So we got, uh, let's just right. look at one scene from the Bill Guy film. And so, there, okay. so Dusty, we're just going to look at the first scene. We might look at the first two, that and the Kennedy scene, but I just want to give you a sense of another great talking head, and this is um, D. Jerome Tweeten, but, but I also want to say this, with, with the, the, the Link film was, was all positive, because you, you can't know Art and Grace Link without just believing that they represent something essential in the North Dakota agrarian character what we thought we were. What, they so represented what we thought we were. <laughs> with, with Bill Guy, it's a little bit different. There were controversies in his life, and big ones. And he, as you, there were a couple of things. One is um, Robert McCarney. His nemesis was Robert McCarney, the car dealer. And we wanted to put that scene in the film because, A, it's funny, and B, it's important that, that, that McCarney was the, sort of the Jarvis of North Dakota life. He was an anti-tax guy. He was the People's Tribune. He caused a lot of trouble, but he also represented a serious anti-government point of view. And you can't tell the Bill Guy story without telling that. And so we put that in, and the Guy family was not as happy with that scene as they would have been if we'd left it out. And then he also ran for the United States Senate in 1974 and lost, as you all can remember, narrowly lost to Milton R. Young and it was thought that there was a spoiler campaign by James Jungroth from Jamestown. And he lost by, I think, 174 votes. Uh, he was a young man at the time of this election, was Bill Guy. And it kind of broke his heart, and he retired from politics. And one of our best men, one of the best governors in North Dakota history, retired really way too early because of the bitterness and the loss of this key Senate election in 1974. So we told that story. And so... You know, when the families are still alive of the people that you're talking about, it sometimes is an interesting negotiation because th they don't have any control over the film, but they do have to watch it, and they will let you know what they think. So this first scene from the Bill Guy film is about this broken trajectory that he's the governor, elected four times, He's really the most important political figure of the post-war period. And then suddenly in 1974, that trajectory stalls out. So let's watch that clip quickly. When he went to ask my grandfather if he could marry my mother, my grandfather asked him, what do you intend to do? He said, I, I intend to be the governor of North Dakota. He said, I'm going to start out farming, but I intend to be the governor of North Dakota. That's what he did. The people of North Dakota liked Bill Guy. They liked his not being a rash person. They liked his measured tones while speaking. They, they liked the fact he did not rush in foolishly to any project, that he was conservative in outlook, that he was a war hero. North Dakotans liked that. He came from a, conservative is not quite the right word, but a very respectable, background. You know, he was a Presbyterian. 
He was well educated. He had a degree from the University of Minnesota. He was, you know, he was an economist by training. He was not what you associate with North Dakota Democrats, which is a sort of uh, almost reactionary populism. Uh, and there was none of that in, in, in Bill Guy. On the other hand, he was very much a liberal in the sense that he saw uh, government as the way to get things done. The autobiography um, that uh, Bill Guy wrote is a perplexing book. It's a very positive trajectory. It looks like you know what's going to happen on the next page. He uh, is a prize basketball athlete. He's uh, a very bright young man. He goes uh, into the United States Navy, uh, scarcely survives that experience, has a couple business stumbles, but you expect the next page to be better. There's this trajectory. He's running a successful farm. He's, his family is so photogenic, they're used for advertising. He's courted by both the Democrats and the Republicans to run for office. The trajectory should be that he's in the Senate. One of the things I really like about Bill Guy is that he is a good listener. If you sit with Bill Guy and you talk, he has this way of cocking his head just a little bit. I don't know that he knows he does it, but he has this way of just leaning forward a little bit and just tilting that head and listening to you. And it's like, I want to know what you have to say to me. And the other thing about Bill Guy is that when you were in a room, for example, talking about things like water policy, Bill Guy likely knew more about that policy than anybody else in the room, including the experts that had gathered. It's just the way he was. He was an economist, and so he sort of saw the economy as a system. And, and you, could, you could apply force at given spots in the system. And if you applied great force, you could make great change. And of course, great force in our system means government. And so that's what he did with, with amazing effectiveness, I think. No matter what you were working on, uh, Governor Bill Guy would bring a keen intellect, uh, an understanding, a patience, and a strength of character, as well as a real desire to determine how we can do more. How can we make what you're working on work? How can we do it here in North Dakota? How can we do it in a way that it advances the interests of the state? And, and he would do it in a very collaborative, inclusive way. Bill Guy was North Dakota's first modern era governor. This is the guy that got the interstate built, got water moving, pushed along electrical generation, along with the cooperatives. This is the guy that set the banquet table for today's feast in North Dakota. When Bill Guy appeared on the political scene in the late 1950s, North Dakota was still a farm state. Remote from the nation's centers of power, North Dakota was what favorite son Eric Severide called a blank spot at the center of the continent. With its rudimentary road system, sturdy small towns and family farms, in 1960, North Dakota was the most agrarian state in the Union. Life on the northern Great Plains was in many respects unchanged since statehood in 1889. The Great Depressions of the 1920s and 30s, coupled with protracted drought and two world wars, had put the northern plains into a kind of stall. North Dakota was still an isolated prairie society when Bill Guy launched his remarkable political career. It was as if North Dakota had been waiting for a new brand of leadership. So again, you see, I mean, this is, this is what's so much fun about this, Larry. You go and say to Jerome Tweeten, can we interview you? And he says yes. And you go to the governor, John Hoven, and he finds time in his schedule. And Mike Jacobs and Jim Fugley and a range of other people, Jim Jungroth and I think we probably interviewed 50 people for that film and had several hundred hours of interview. And then you go through it and you watch it and you, and you think, well, what, what builds this story? You know, how do you tell this story? And so I try at the beginning of these films to have a range of voices all talking about the same thing from different perspectives so that it kind of builds a, an early portrait that then you go on to explore in the rest of the film. It's a shame because Jerry Tweeten 
I interviewed for three hours, and if we just showed that for three hours, it would be a fascinating document, and then most of it winds up just in, on the cutting room floor, and it, it, we keep it and we contribute it to the State Historical Society's permanent archives, but it's a, you know, it, just, it just breaks your heart not to be able to put more in. As one who's written thousands of words, you can always expand on something. Do you find it really difficult when you're making a movie that you can't do that? You just gotta go, bap, this is it. Whereas when you're writing, you can add another page or two pages to expand on what your idea is. You can, but, but you know, no one wants to read a thousand page book on anything. And so discipline and brevity are essential. And I'm not, as you know, the best person in the world at this. <laughs> but when you get an hour format in a documentary film, that's what you have. You can't make it an hour and three minutes. You can't make it an hour and 37 minutes. It has to be an hour. And there's a story you want to tell. And you have to choose what things you can afford to tell. You don't want to just have an Encyclopedia Britannica film that says Bill Guy was born on such and such a date, and then he graduated from high school, and he was in 4-H, and he got married. And that's, no, that's not interesting, because these are humanities films. They're films that are trying to wrestle with what was this person, and what, what did she or he contribute, and why does it matter, and what are the questions that person was, 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 was working on. And so you try to find talking heads like yourself who can do that, who can bring that insight to it, and then you have to marshal them in a way that's interesting, and you have to keep the pace moving. And so you know, it, it is very difficult to, to limit this. And even, what, take the, the Harold Schaefer film. We just finished that, so it's freshest in my mind. You know, we, at one point, I wanted to produce a Harold Schaefer miniseries because we had so much material that you could easily have done three hours or five hours, but, and I don't mean any disrespect to the Schaefer's, but who would watch it? I mean, no one reads my books, uh, <laughs> but who would watch five hours on Bill Guy? Who would watch five hours on Art Link? You know, you watch five hours on Winston Churchill. You watch five hours on the Civil War, but you don't watch three or five hours on A.C. Townley or Bill Langer. So you just have to, it's a really interesting form in that respect, but I want the audience to feel that something, when they've seen the film, I want them to be wanting to know more, and I want them to feel like we've covered the ground fairly, that it's a fair treatment of that person. And Bill, I actually think the Bill Guy film is a better documentary film than the Art Link film. It's not as, it's not as romantic, but I think it's a better piece of work, but it didn't get the same attention so let's watch one more segment. Dusty, if you would just do the Bob McCarney segment, there's something I want to show in that. We'll skip over Kennedy and do Bob McCarney. Robert McCarney hitchhiked to North Dakota in 1932 with 50 cents in his pocket. He found work selling pencils on Main Avenue. By 1957, he had purchased the Universal Motor Company, which he renamed McCarney Ford. Between 1963 and 1980, he placed 15 initiated measures and referrals on the North Dakota ballot. 10 of those measures were successful. Robert McCarney was Bill Guy's political nemesis. And although he never held public office, one thing is certain, nobody will ever forget Bob McCarney. And we had, um a very interesting political figure by the name of Bob McCarney that was, <laughs> was in there. Bob McCarney. He was a stinker. He really was a stinker. <laughs> Loud suits. The only thing predictable about my dad was he was unpredictable, and he would say that. A gadfly who, who <laughs> just wouldn't go away. <laughs> oh, Bob. Well, I knew Bob very well. You know, Bob was, Bob was a real character. And uh, Bob did not like Bill Guy. Uh, we can be clear about that. It isn't what the uh, people of uh, North Dakota want, it's what the governor wants. And it doesn't, he doesn't seem to know what he does want, except he wants to tax you for everything you do. His, his chief political rival for virtually his whole time in office was Bob McCarney, who was a person whom I liked personally and had some admiration for, but who was a, you know, a bumptious character, you know, almost out of central casting. 
Robert McCarney of Bismarck has started a referral movement again this year. To put it mildly, McCarney is not happy with the Democratic tax package. He was championing uh, uh, getting rid of the personal property tax. Of course, we asked uh, his idea, plan. And he took the cigar out of his mouth, and he says, that's very simple. He just passed a law, and you eliminate uh, personal property tax, effective uh, January 1 of uh, 1970. Puts the cigar back in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and we're waiting for the rest of it. And then I, I guess I was the one that said, well, um, Mr. McCarney, uh, uh, how would you suggest that we address that variance in replacing his revenue? Takes a cigar out of his mouth and he says, well, that's for you smart guys to figure out. <laughs> yeah. And yet McCarney had a following. I mean, Bob McCarney, had his own following. The root of what he was saying is, I don't like government, and I want less of it. It was kind of like a battering ram for the Guy administration. I think he wanted to run government more like a business, and he didn't think it was being run that way. Now, sometimes, you know, when you have opposition, they have a case to be made. But I don't see that that's the role he played at all. He has to understand that those kind of people are necessary in a democratic government to stir things up. Because otherwise, you get away with murder. You do. But if this becomes a, a law, it'll take two thirds to change it and you will live with it the rest of your life. And North Dakota is set back 50 years. So, what I like about, I love this sequence from this film because did you notice that Earl Strinden starts to talk about him and he laughs? And then almost everyone who talked about him winds up laughing. So this, you can't plan for this. You're just interviewing people and they would, I'd say, tell me about Bob McCartney and they would start and then they would laugh. But it was, an, it was kind of an affirmative laugh too, kind of like an affection. And so we assembled that piece with all these clips to show that even though he might have been a pain in the rear end of Bill Guy, there was something kind of compellingly comic and just kind of life-affirming and affectionate about this, this conflict. So, that, you know, a scene like that is three minutes long. Uh, the amount of material that we had about the Bob McCartney piece, we had to decide, do we or do we not even include it? But the amount of material we had for that might have been an hour and 30 minutes. And then you, when you finally decide, well, we will do a, a sequence on that, then you have to take all that material and create a story in, in three, three minutes. minutes. Yeah. And the music adds to it. But that's the fun of it, is being in the editing room. And I should say, David Swenson of Makoche Recording Studios has been our editor, and he's a genius. It's just a pleasure to work with him. But you sit in that studio, and you start. we might have started this piece on Friday afternoon at 4, and we would go home merely to sleep and be done Monday afternoon, and that's a three-minute piece of the film, and you think, wow, can it be worth it? Yeah. It's an awful lot of, you move a little piece, you put Earl Strinden before Mike Jacobs, and then you move Mike Jacobs before Earl Strinden, and then you move them both back, and then you eliminate them both, and then you bring them back in, and it just takes forever. I suppose you're making that decision on who's bouncing off of whom. Yeah, you saw that Sharon Spadey, Mac's daughter, is the, she doesn't laugh about her father. And she and, and Lloyd Omdahl sort of get into it. Now, they were never in the same space, but Lloyd says he's the only bitter voice in this sequence where he says, you know, there are people who do a, a, an important thing as opposition leaders, and then there's this idiot. And he never really forgave Bob McCartney. But then she says, wait a minute, we need people like my dad. Whether, you know, they may be nuisances, but we need them, and they're an important part of government. And so I try to get to balance these things, but also to get these voices talking to each other. Okay. So we should, we should move on yep. to the Schaefer film. <laughs> I think so. So go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm going to get your... Let's move. I want to show a little slide here. These are just pieces. There we so I want to show... Um, I'll come back to some of these. There, this, this is a very crude oh my drawing that I'd made this morning. Okay. 
But if you see up here, I'm going to do the one on the left here. Um, here's the film. So there's a 60-minute film, right? And you're interviewed in this film. And I interviewed Larry for about Hours. an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah, a long time. For this film. And he gets in for about a total of 30 seconds, maybe. That doesn't mean that this is the whole interview. Let's just, I'm being pretty hard on you. Well, let's say this is the usable part of the interview, this little box. But the whole interview is about many, many things. The usable parts that are really, you just want to be in the film <coughs> are here. And then you get this tiny little 30 second piece. And that's true for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the hardest part of this film was Shyla, because Shyla has never said an uninteresting thing. And she sticks the landing every time. And she's hilarious and compelling and moving. And she cries and she laughs. And I mean, it's a, it's, it's a giant privilege to interview Shyla Schaefer. And I had th more than 30 hours. And you can't let her take over the film, even though you want to. But you can't let her because it's about Harold Schaefer. And so you take this enormous amount of rich material and you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until you get to kind of a statistical minimum. So there were probably, for the Schaefer film, 30 interviews totaling 75 hours worth of tape. Then you have still photographs, and I've just, I didn't, it's just very crudely drawn here, but I, I did all the scanning. So you take a, a flatbed scanner. And Harold was one of the best photograph people in North Dakota history. Um, there is an enormous Harold Schaefer photo archive, and Randy Hudson Bueller has most of it out at the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation in a storage vault. And I think I literally scanned 3,000 or 3,500 photographs. Could have scanned 10,000, but I scanned about 3,500 photographs. And you know what that means. Put the photograph down on the bed, close the cover, it scans, save, and title the next one. And eventually, you get so many that you're overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed in hard drives, and you're overwhelmed in overstimulation. And so out of all those 3,500 scanned photographs, the good news is I've given them to Randy Hudson Bueller so that they have a permanent archive of scanned photographs now. But we probably used 150 in the course of the film. So most of them wind up not getting used. Then Dr. Everett, Beverly Everett, did the music for the film. And these are my crude music bars. But um, so she's, she's creating that while working with David Swenson and watching the film and trying to figure the rhythms of the film out and then creating music to fit it. And then there's my narrative. I don't write that until the very end, but we have outlines. But at the end, then I write, I try to speak as little as possible in the film just to cover stuff that doesn't get told in any other way. So you have that. All of these elements have to fold together. And when you, it's like chaos theory, Larry, when you have one element, if you only were producing an audio program on Harold Schaefer, that would be a lot of work. If you add audio and video, that more than doubles it. If you add audio, video, and still pictures, that more than triples it. And so you, eventually you get such complexity. It's like the, you know, the butterfly theory. If you move one piece at minute six, it affects everything all the way down the line and changes the tone and the feel of the film. And then there's titling. And one of the hardest things in these films is what to title them. And I was never happy with um, the title, Mr. Bubble, um, the Harold Schaefer story. It just doesn't seem to me to, to really get at the greatness of Harold Schaefer. But it, we knew that it would appeal, that it would be instantly recognizable. With Bill Guy, you know, I was very committed to the title, The Charisma of Competence, because I don't know if you all remember Larry Remley, but Larry Remley was the state's leading historian for a long time, and he died much, much, much too young of a heart attack in his early 40s. And he was asked about Bill Guy, and he wasn't particularly a fan of Bill Guy, but he was asked, and he, and he said, well, he sure didn't have charisma, but he had the charisma of competence. When I heard that phrase, I thought, that's exactly what he had. There's a, comp there's a charisma that comes from doing everything you do well. And so that kind of summarized him for me. But finding titles for these films is really hard because you want it to appeal to the public, to sort of say what the film is about, to be accurate in some sense. What would you rather have called this than Mr. Bubble? That's the problem. I couldn't, 
You can't say glass wax. No. You know, snowy bleach. Okay. So, so do you have any thoughts about that? No, nope, no. Nope. So, this, so this is just some of the complexity of this. So it, it costs about $100,000 to produce a film like this, and it takes about two years to do it. And when you get it all done, you've squeezed and squeezed and squeezed it, and by the time we finish, I sort of hate the film because it's not everything I dreamed of, and I had to leave that important episode out, and I had to squeeze that talking head out, and go all the way to Colorado Springs, and then you can't even use this piece. And then it's shown, and then it kind of disappears. And so it's a strange phenomenon, making documentaries. So in Mr. Bubble, how many hours of video interviews did you have? 75 hours. 75 hours. And, that, and how long is the? the? Film is one hour. Okay. And so, but if you, if you actually add up, I, afterwards I added up the talking heads. You did not come out well. <laughs> but, you know, Ed Schaefer gets, he's the biggest talking head in the film, and he gets something like seven minutes and 13 seconds of total time. And then you go to someone like Jim Fugley, who is a friend of Harold's, and he's, I put him in all of my films because, where he has something to say because he's so good. Jim's in for like two minutes and 12 seconds. And so. How long is Shyla in it? Shyla's in for, she's just under Ed. But if I, had, if I had just let it happen, she'd be in for 59 minutes and 12 seconds, <laughs> and Harold would be a footnote. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you can't, the, the hardest thing in knowing Shyla is, is containing her. Yeah. And so, but she was brilliant. So now let's go, go do, ahead. Do you want to watch the clip, or do you, do you want to go through those stills first? I, no, I didn't bring stills. No, I mean, you had them here. Oh, those stills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can go back and just quickly look at this. So. Um, so let me just talk about this This is one. a great this shot. Is, it's a great photograph. What is it? This is when Harold Schaefer donated the land on which Bismarck State College is built. And so this was uh, the ceremony that day when he turned over his horse pasture to the city of Bismarck. He gave this rich Missouri Bluff horse pasture yep. to the city of Bismarck so that it could create a new campus for Bismarck Junior College, now Bismarck State College. And this story is written about in Larry Wywoody's book, which is the official biography of, of Harold Schaefer. It was the windiest day in human history, which of course one can say 13 times a year in North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. But here's the problem. I love this photograph. We couldn't use it because it's not high enough in resolution. And so if you blow it up big enough to be in the film, then it pixelates. Oh. And see, I'll show you one from, like, from the Kennedys. Like there, that's a great photograph, but you couldn't use it because it's not high enough in res. And so today, if you're scanning, when I scanned, I was scanning at 600 DPI, which is high res. But these were probably scanned at 75 DPI long ago, and you can't get the originals, and so there are lots of things you simply can't use. And this photograph of, of Harold is just too small to be used, so you wind up leaving out a lot of things that you would really quite like to use. But this was a great day in the history of Bismarck and the history of the college. And, and it, it was so windy that they, you see they put something on the microphones, but it doesn't even help. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Harold. Again, it's pretty pixelated, but there he is sitting in the Burning Hills Amphitheater. And then I found these hats. <laughs> Shyla turned me loose. And I found these hats, and Harold wore one and Shiloh wore one. And this is Bill Sorensen, who's one of the stars of the, of the Medora musical. And I found them in the garage, and they look even dumber now than they did in 1965. <laughs> uh, but, um, and this is Shiloh, this is, the film ends with this, and we may or may not get to this, but Shiloh every year, at the beginning of the summer and the end of the summer, goes up Buck Hill, the highest point in Theodore Roosevelt National Park, in a gratitude ceremony. She's done it 49 years in a row. And this was last year. And then, just last week, I took Shyla up for her 49th time to the top of Buck Hill, and we took this empty bottle of champagne. Of course. Yeah. And, um, and here she is on a beautiful, beautiful day on Buck Hill. And so you saw in the first film, the Art Link film, there are kind of these comic outtakes. There are a few of them at the end of this film, too. So after all of that, after spending a couple of years working on this, 
we finally finished the film and released it. It's been shown on Prairie Public. It'll be launched in Bismarck and in Fargo and so on. Now, here's what I've done. I don't think we have time for this, but we should, we should show some of this. Yep. So we should start, and then I'll ask Dusky, Dusty to stop at a point or two. Okay. But this is the second half of the film, parts of it. In 1986, the Schaefer family decided to sell the Gold Seal Company. Harold's focus was increasingly on Medora. He and the president of Gold Seal, Ed, his son, could not see eye to eye about the future direction of the company. You know, we got to this point of saying we have, we have competing goals, things are difficult, and it was a tumultuous time in the company. Um, he was spending money on things that we were putting in pools for acquisitions or new products or, you know, and they, I mean, this, the, the whole thing was in disarray. Harold had his own rules and he stuck with them through thick and thin. And we saw a lot of areas and places in Harold's history where things got pretty thin. But through thick and thin, he believed in Harold. And because of that, he and I got into some pretty pretty tough hassles about the direction of the company. And I remember quitting one time and storming out of his office and, you know, he fired me here and there and it got bad. I mean, you know, and, and it was always, I mean, I, I'm my father's son. Um, I have strong opinions. <laughs> I have, I, you know, I, I, I really felt strongly about what we had to do and what we had, we couldn't do. Um, I think uh, to some extent, um, I was, uh, I was so enraptured in my own direction and abilities that I discounted his, and vice versa. Harold was the epitome of a servant leader, even if he couldn't put it all together. I mean, he looked at his life as work, but he'd always say, no one had more fun in life than I did. He didn't have hobbies, he didn't have other businesses, he didn't have investments in apartment buildings or other, you know, he didn't, he didn't have anything but Gold Seal Company, his family, and his charity. That was his life. And so he didn't imagine, he couldn't imagine himself being somebody without Gold Seal Company. How he ever broke away from that, I do not know. I mean, I just, I don't know how he was capable of doing that. You know. He retired for one day. A number of corporations sought to acquire Gold Seal, but none of them wanted to purchase the unprofitable Medora division of the company. Eventually, the family decided to create a public nonprofit to be called the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. Looking back, it was the right thing to do. Um, absolutely the right thing to do. When I think about his dream of um, Medora and the Badlands and making that available, again, you don't see Harold's name on Medora or on the Badlands. Uh, the only folks who put Harold's name on we do it because we love him so much and we don't want him to be forgotten. I mean, you have to look at the way that this unfolded was exactly the perfect best thing for not only Medora, not only state of North Dakota, but for Harold Schaefer. Medora Foundation was, was the best thing for Harold Schaefer that anybody could have ever imagined in any way you look at it. We hope we have made you want to come and visit us. Here in Medora, in the Badlands of the Prairie, the Rough Riders Hotel of Teddy Roosevelt days are all waiting for you. Come and see us. If somebody asked me what I thought of Harold when I first saw him, I thought, what a dude. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you ever saw some of the clothes that Harold wore, the, he had a lot of bling. Um, <laughs> it was just, and he walked 100 miles an hour. I remember that part of it. And he was the center of attention. If he walked into a building, if it was a coffee shop or into the saloon, he'd say, set them up, boys, and I'm paying. His mind was just so full of what he was going to do. Uh, he was an exciting person to live with. There's a wonderful picture. I've got it 
at home and it's a picture showing Harold walking away from the old Rough Rider Hotel and the, the windows are hanging down and it's in really terrible shape and he's got a beautiful suit on, he used to have his suits made in Chicago and white shoes and he's walking as fast as he can, it's like I know what I'm going to do. When he first came here, he, he strutted around like he was going to buy up the whole countryside no matter what happened, you know? And yeah, he tried to, and I think that's what got him into that, that predicament that he was maybe not quite so liked. Well, I don't want to say disliked, but it was just like, well, we can't compete with that sort of a person, you know, that has that kind of money. But it was Harold pushing along some of those early leaders who got it right along with him. Governor Bill Guy, Joe Satran. And then he had the genius to surround himself with really, really good people, and I think right away of Rod Jaden. Harold was a father figure for Rod, honestly. Rod looked up to Harold so very much, respected most of his business decisions, certainly the, the growth of the Gold Seal Company. Rod made things happen. Rod took the vision, the dreams of Harold Schaefer, and put them into action. Rod had some little trouble with Harold sometimes too because Harold would be shaving one morning and he would jot down something, let's do so and so. And Rod would look at that note and he would say, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't do that. He would come up with the dangdest things at the dangdest times and say, boys, I gotta have her done by this date. He just was always in the midst of everyone. He was like bigger than life. After you got to know him, and as the years went on, and as he got older and stuff, he became a different person, I feel. He became way different. He was more sincere, he was more giving, he was more making sure that, that we treated the people the way he would want it to be treated. Many people had done him favors, he never forgot them, and he wanted to gift back that Western Dakota, the West experience of the edge of the frontier to the people of, of America. And so he worked in beautiful harmony with the National Park Service eventually to create an experience in Medora. Medora is a fulfillment. It's a fulfillment where people now are going out there. Uh, they are experiencing Western North Dakota. They're experiencing the Badlands. They're experiencing Theodore Roosevelt and the Marquis, but they're, but they're experiencing kind of this love of the area. The, the spirit of what's out there. That's what he wanted to grasp onto. That's a fulfillment. Take a moment and think about the awesome beauty surrounding us. Breathtaking, isn't it? This stage is special to us. The band, the cast, and the crew, and well, it's an honor to perform for you tonight. But we ask that you think about the grander stage surrounding us. What an imagination God must have to have created these beautiful badlands. Before you depart from us, we encourage you to go out and create your own dream in this legendary place. There's a winding path through a field of wheat on a plot of land by a rambling creek that finds its way into that old Missouri just a few miles down the road. And the evening sun in brilliant golds and reds set the rocks on fire below the thunderheads. And it's here my spirit rose. Shiloh Schaefer for the very first time and Medora had lunch with her. Went to the musical that night, was sitting next to her. The very first parts of these, this routine started with high band and the whoops and all of that. And I turned to her and I said, Shiloh, I want you to come to our orchestra concerts and whoop. And the person with us said, you're gonna regret this. You're not gonna want this. <laughs> In 1964, 
Harold was offered the opportunity to own Medora's summer stock theater production called Old Four Eyes, on the condition that he pay off the show's many debts. Of course, he jumped at the chance, then flew to France to lease the land on which the amphitheater was built from Tony, the grandson of the French aristocrat and cattle baron, the Marquis de Mores. From these simple beginnings on a rudimentary stage enveloped by crude wooden benches was born the Medora Musical, the greatest show in the West. Every evening from July through early September, the Burning Hill singers of Medora recreate some of the life stories of Teddy Roosevelt. Harold was a sales genius, but he was the first to admit that he did not know much about theater. Fortunately, he married a master performer. And she did have an education in drama. She'd been in it. She understood music. She understood acting. She understood fashion. She understood choreography. And where Dad would sit back and say, yeah, that's a nice show, Shyla could look at it and say, you know what? That dress has to go. She had a great, uh, great sense of how to make that show patriotic, to make it TR, to make it family, to make it fun, to bring God into it, to be uplifting. She could, um, just like sewing a patchwork quilt, she could see how these pieces would work together. Still, Harold knew exactly what he wanted to communicate on that stage. You know if Harold Schaefer was sitting here, at some point you were going to get this message because at some point during that meeting, Harold would not have spoken hardly at all, but he would say, I don't know anything about a show. I don't know anything about producing a musical. But I know this, that show's gotta start with a bang, it's gotta have a bang in the middle, and it's gotta have a bang at the end, and then the meeting was over. Where the roots grow deep and the wind blows clean Where the air is fresh and the summer green Well, it's entertaining from, from the moment that, that you get in the car with her and she, she makes it a whole experience and, and, and it's always kind of the same thing, but I, but I love this part of it and so you drive in with her and she says to the people at the parking lot, I'm a bus. And she drives all the way up and you think for just a moment that you're gonna go right over the cliff because she's already so excited and she drives up and you park and you kind of you know give a little sigh of relief that you're still safe. Welcome to the Medora Musical here at the beautiful Bernie Nails Amphitheater. The most beautiful of all. And what color are the hills? A thousand colors. They're just magic. <laughs> the musicians start to walk out on stage, she makes a great production of saying, hi band, hi band, hi band. <laughs> and then, you know, everybody comes and talks to her and the musicians and the performers in the musical also come up to her afterwards. You know, they, she, she affirms everybody. You know, Harold would, would fill a room. Shiloh fills the amphitheater. All eyes turn to her. It's as if one of those spotlights were turned on her. I sort of like that. I'm not making this up. Here we go. Fabulous story it tells, though. The well, he, whole musical in Medora, 112 people and 3 million people have been through town to see something. Music. I mean, if you think of that photograph that Shyla talks about where Harold is walking in his white bucks and he has the suit on, and he, if you look at the hotel, it was a wreck. Right. I mean, Medora was, a, was Marmoth. It was a godforsaken, broken-down ghost town. 
And Harold, the opening scene of the film is Harold up on the top of the bluff with his son Ed saying, Ed tells the story, when Ed was six, Governor Schaefer tells the story, when he was six, he's up on the bluff with his father. And they're looking, this is like 1950, and they're looking down in the ghost town, and Harold says, son, we've got to save this. There's too much to be lost. And Ed says, dad, there's nothing there. <laughs> And so then Harold has this vision, and he makes it work. And Kermit Lindstrom, by the way, whose health is suffering right now, we, you know, we send out our regards to him and his family, but he's in the film, and he talks about what a, he says, Medora was just a pit. You know, the restrooms were filthy and dirty. Uh, they were outhouses at that time. There was nothing there, and Harold decided he was going to create something special there, and he wound up creating North Dakota's number one tourist destination, which continues to, um, to, you know, to fulfill everyone's expectations and beyond to this date. Who would have thought you could go to a town like Marmoth or Medora or Grassy Butte and put up an amphitheater and literally put 3,000 people in, that, in those stands? This summer, Shyla told me that on almost every Saturday night, they had more than 2,500 people this summer. It's just shocking to think that you can even do that. Don't you think it's a sign of greatness to be able to have that vision that Harold had? I mean, isn't that when we think of great people, it's having a vision that no one else has. And I'm sure there is no one else <laughs> that would have gone to that bluff in Medora and looked down and said, there's something worth saving here. Absolutely. I mean, this is, I mean it's, thinking about Harold Schaefer, so, you know, most people here know the story, but he grew up um, on a really, really poor farm. Uh, up in the Washburn area. And when he was seven years old, his family was just struggling to survive in the really difficult time in North Dakota history. And it was right by Stanton. And when he was seven years old, Harold accidentally burned the house down. And so the house is burned down now, and they, they move in with others, and his father leaves the family when Harold's 14. And it's a really rough story. And Harold, even as a young boy, was working two, three, five little odd jobs and already giving away much of what he earned. He'd say, you'd see you and you'd say, you want a pop? You want a candy bar? I mean, he just, the, one of his genes was to give money away. And so then he becomes a traveling salesman. And in the cover of the film, which um, is one of my favorite pictures of Harold, let me see if I can find it here. This, this is a picture, a recreated photograph of Harold in the basement of his home in Bismarck. What he did was he, was a, he worked for a paint and glass store in Fargo. And then at some point he said, oh, you know, I'll buy bulk floor wax and I'll pour it into my own cans and I'll retail it. And then he, um, he, he got cans at the dump and he poured through a funnel, this high quality industrial floor wax into these little cans. And then he literally took a portable typewriter and typed the labels and then glued them onto the cans and sold them. And he met his longtime administrative assistant, Irma, because she lived in the same house as a renter. And she said she and her sister couldn't sleep at night because some idiot was typing all night long. <laughs> She's up typing the labels. And so Irma finally went to Harold and said, look, if you give me the stuff to type, I'll type it so that my sister and I can sleep. And she became his most trusted employee and became a partner in the Gold Seal Company and a very big figure in all of this. And so here's this man who started with nothing. You didn't start with nothing. I didn't start with nothing. He started with nothing. Mm -hmm. And he became North Dakota's first great national figure, really our first public millionaire, at a time when millionaire was the same as billionaire, billionaire today. Yeah. And he knew Arthur Godfrey, and he knew Perry Como, and he knew Liberace, and all these figures. And he was this larger-than-life guy, dressed like you. <laughs> you know, just crazy, he crazy. Nice shoes. Yeah. yeah. And, and became this person. So that, that story is interesting. It, he, he was the youngest man ever to win the Horatio Alger Award for rags to riches. That's an interesting story, but that's only the beginning of the story because once he got all of that wealth, he gave it all gave away. away. He, he gave, when he was dying, 
Shyla tells the story, it's in the film. Well, I can't tell it as well, but Harold's in bed in the hospital, kind of musing and drifting in and out of sleep, and he says at some point, well, Shyla, I really think I have given away all my money. <laughs> And then there's a stage pause. <laughs> then he says, you have some, don't you? And it turns out Shyla did have a little nest egg somewhere. But imagine if you gave away everything you have. I mean, this almost never happens. And then he made Medora uh, his last great entrepreneurial effort. And so, something we can't play here, but that Ed says in the film is so interesting. Governor Schaefer says, I don't know if I really agree with this, but of course, I'm not the son of Harold Schaefer. But he says, if, when they tried to sell the company, Gold Seal, they wanted to sell the Medora division with it. And a number of corporations looked at it and said, no, we'll take Glass Wax, we'll take Mr. Bubble, we'll take Snowy Bleach, but we do not want the unprofitable Medora division. And Ed Schaefer says in the film, if that had gone the other way, Dad probably wouldn't have lived more than a year or two after the sale. It was Medora that gave him a new lease on life and another big thing to do with his great energy, and that that prolonged his life because it gave him a sense that there was another thing that he could do that was still doable yeah. with the fortune that he had accumulated. Do we have another clip So let's now? just quickly watch the, if, Dusty, if you have it, yep. the end of the film. And then we'll see if there's we'll any see, questions we'll, here. Then we'll leave. On February 1st, 1987, Bismarck threw Harold Schaefer a giant party to celebrate his 75th birthday. It was organized by his friends Kermit Lidstrom and Bill Sorensen. I got to talk to a lot of people that knew Harold and loved Harold. Uh, and so every day it was like something new. Somebody would call or I'd receive one of the letters and I'd go, wow, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, and, and just the, the love uh, that there was and respect for uh, who he was and what he had done. Letters of tribute poured in from all over the country, full of love, praise, thanks, and reminiscence. Everyone celebrated Harold's love of family, his love of country, his love of North Dakota. But the common theme was Harold Schaefer's generosity the big kind that underwrites institutions and causes, and the more particular kind that makes all the difference in people's lives. I remember one Sunday after church, Michelle and I and the kids, and Harold and Shiloh went down to Meriwether's restaurant in Bismarck for Sunday brunch. We found our table and were seated, and the proprietor came by to say hello, said, Harold, how are you? And Harold, at that point, wasn't even able to lift his right hand off the table. His health was so poor he couldn't lift his arm. So I remember he took his left hand, picked up his right, shook hands with Marv and said, wonderful. And he was just beaming. I mean, even at that point when his health was so bad he couldn't lift his arm, he still thought he was the luckiest guy in town. In 1993, the Medora Foundation's Jim Fugley spent a day interviewing his boss and friend, Harold Schaefer. The goal was to create a welcome video for the new Harold Schaefer Center in Medora. While the cameras were rolling, Harold, now 81, took time to reflect on the journey of his life and career, his family, his dreams, and his achievement. He seemed also to say goodbye. He asked one of my grandchildren once in Medora, where's uh, your grandpa? And uh, this little girl looked up and said, well, I don't know, but you walk down the street and he's probably out there in the middle of the street talking to somebody. Well, that was the fun we had in Medora. If the Medora assets would have gone with the sale of Gold Seal Company, which was the original plan, um, and he wouldn't have had Medora to fall back on, he'd have died. In fact, we kind of miss it today since we've created the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. I wish I had another Gold Seal company to pour some more money into Medora to make it even better and more beautiful for more people. <laughs> How would Medora be different if Harold and Shyla had not been here? What's the definition of legacy? Medora is relevant and will be forever because of Harold and Shyla Schaefer. Medora is their legacy, I would say. Uh, in addition to many more things they have done for people and organizations of, 
uh, in North Dakota and around the world. It, 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 it's, it's a beautiful part of the story because it has a permanence about it. And it has a, a future that is so promising and a future that continues to change. And so he's not locked in. I mean, his story lives on through thousands of people. He seemed to absorb everything around him and process it and, and turn it to something good. I, I just, I was never in his presence where he didn't make me feel loved. He was so warm with me and would always, I'd say, oh, how are you, Harold? And he'd always say, wonderful, wonderful, but much better now that you're here. And he was not afraid to tell me that, that I was the best thing that ever happened to his son. You can't lock Harold up. His story continues and it continues to be told, but the story continues through countless other people. Uh, it isn't what the world tells a man, it isn't what they hang on his head, it isn't what uh, they say he said. In his lifetime, he has to live with himself. And I know, uh, and I'm the only guy that knows some of the things that I did that weren't so good, and uh, some of the things I did that might not have been wanting to be on the front page of a newspaper. And so I never have had the feeling of having earned uh, a medal or a plaque or somebody saying you did something nice. And so I probably am a little short of what a lot of people would call the pride. It was after hours. I know everybody was gone already. It was probably six or something in the evening. And I'm walking by and he says, Randy. And I said, yeah, Harold, what can I do for you? And he says, have you ever watched the sunset? Yeah? No, have you ever really watched the sunset? Maybe not, Harold. I, what, what, come on in here. And this is what he made me do. We sat in those two leather chairs up in the fourth floor of the Gold Seal building. And you know, the horizon, you're probably looking out somewhere between Mandan and New Salem. And the, the sun is getting close. So he says, and when it gets on the horizon, we have to be quiet until it's gone. So he sat there perfectly quiet. We didn't say anything after that. And I walked away and I thought, I wonder how many times he's done that. And it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome to sit for three, three and a half minutes, not say a word, and just watch this gorgeous sunset. Camera's going. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know truly how to describe my feelings in Medora. I know I love it here. I know I'm excited when I come here. But truly, I spent my life trying to give that feeling to you. I hope that you could acquire some love of Medora, some interest in the land, some ideas about the community that would give you some good thoughts and some kind feelings uh, when you leave here. That's why I worked here. That's why I left here when the good Lord takes me away. Shut off the lights. Three quick things. Number one, I hope you heard um, Beverly Everett's music underneath this. You know, we take music for granted when you see a film, when you go to, to the theater. And I was at a concert of hers about Hollywood um, film scores, and I just shut my eyes and listened to them. I thought, oh my, music is such an important part of film. And she was gracious enough to donate music to this film. Second thing, Sister Thomas was here and left. I'm glad she did because I wanted to say something about her. She is a world-class talking head. We could have used, she is, I mean, she, she just, just radiates authenticity and wisdom. And I could have used two hours of Sister Thomas. She's so good. And 
we, I we get into these kind of creative arguments about how much can we use of this, and I kept pushing for more and more and more of Sister Thomas because she has such a depth of soul that just comes right through the camera, and so that was really cool. And then finally, the footage of Harold saying goodbye and that kind of weird footage that Jim Fugley um, did, we didn't find, I didn't find that until two weeks before the film was done. Whoa. And we were trying to figure out, how do you end this film? And then I was out in Medora, and Randy said, yeah, I think there's a box of stuff back there. You might want to take a look at it. And it was a bunch of old Betamax um, videotape. And so I had to scrounge to find a way even to view it. And it's not high quality in terms of the technical side, but when I found those statements of Harold, they're so moving, and where he basically says, you know, when, that's what I live for when the good Lord takes me. And then Jim says, well, I'll turn out the lights. I mean, it's just an amazing little piece of archival footage. We, we found that footage that's just been sitting in a vault for 35 years, or 30 years, and then we found some audio tapes, reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes of Harold's fourth national sales meeting, which was at the Prince Hotel here in 1954, and the tapes are unbelievable, and we have a few little excerpts in the film. So the discovery process in a film like this is also really, really interesting. Okay, we're about running out of time, but we do have some microphone, or we have a microphone someplace, there we go. And if anybody has questions. any questions, because uh, we're gonna run against there's the one. bewitching hour here in just a minute. I think there's one in the, in the back. Are there any questions? Francis has the microphone, so. Anybody have a thought or question? No questions at all. Shyla has re rebuttal, right? Shyla's got a rebuttal all written over here, I know that. <laughs> Oh, we've gone on and on, and I apologize, um, but... No questions at all. May, uh, David, are okay. you still here? Let me just say this. We want to do more films. We want to do one on Sister Thomas. And it would be, wouldn't be a documentary like this. I, can, I, I see it as conversations with Sister Thomas, and so it's for an hour. You're just really hearing her talk about faith and Christ and God and the Benedictine story on the prairie and the University of Mary and her life as a, as a spiritual seeker. I would just like to have a rich hour of Sister Thomas talking in her quiet but amazing way. So that's a film we want to make. We want to make a film on A.C. Townley, the rabble rouser who created the Nonpartisan League. We'd like to do a film on Sitting Bull. There's never been an adequate documentary on Sitting Bull. Uh, we'd like to do something on the Bakken oil boom and its many, many implications for the future of North Dakota. I'd like to do a 10-part history of North Dakota for young people on location at different places and have it be available for schools and so on. So if any of you have any oil wells that you're not using, <laughs> um, we, we, David, I'm sure, yeah. would be... David, do you want to just say a word about that? No? Yeah. We don't really need a whole oil well, just 10% of one would be fine. Uh, you can see, folks, we have a wonderful time up at Washburn working with Clay, the Dakota Institute of our foundation. And you talk about a legacy. You know, Clay is building a legacy every breath of every day with his column in the paper, with these films, with all the work he's done with our institute in our foundation. And so I did bring with us today, uh, I have all of our DVDs. Art Blink, Bill Guy, Harold Schaefer, Clay's For the Love of North Dakota, if you haven't picked that up yet, the Theodore Roosevelt book, and the new book, it's not even in stores yet, you can be the first on your block to have. <laughs> not All Heroes, the Vietnam War memoir written by Larry's brother Gary. Clay wrote the foreword, Larry wrote the afterword. I think we'll have them both out front. They'd be happy to sign that book as well. I don't have any hubcaps, but if you want to meet me out in the parking lot, I've got four, so we'll oblige you. Would you just hand the microphone to Shyla for the last word? We'll let Shyla have the last word. Wait, oh, you've got to have a microphone. Perhaps for the rest of my life, I think I've just become a very quiet person. <laughs> That'll be the day. That's it? Well, you know... 
to conclude this, I just want to thank you, Clay, because I think these are really valuable films, and these stories would not be told had, had you not come back to the state to do this. And, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, that's, that may or may not be true, but it, let me just say it is such a privilege to be able to call Sister Thomas and say, I want you to come in for an interview, or to be able to call se former Senator Dorgan and have them want to do this because they care about North Dakota, they want to feature this state. It, the people that I get to, to encounter in these films are just so remarkable, and we literally have hundreds of hours of archival tape, and when work is done 30, 40, 100 years from now on Art Link, on the 1970s, on Bill Guy, on Medora, and so on. All the outtakes, all the stuff that's on the cutting room floor will be available, and it may not be usable as film, but it'll be available to historians and biographers and writers and researchers. You know, it's such a privilege. It's, these are really expensive, it turns out. That's the problem. You know, if you could do it for $15,000, we would have done 20. But. It is, it is just pure joy to do them, and it's been one of the honors of my life to be able to go interview Bill Guy and listen to him and, 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 and to hear his stories. And, you know, Grace Link is very much alive, but Art Link died not so long after that film was released. Horribly, Bill and Gene Guy died this spring, a terrible loss to North Dakota. Uh, Shiloh, of course, will live forever, but... Uh, but what a, what, a, what, a, what a tragedy it would have been not to get right. Art Link and Bill Guy on tape for the tens of hours that we have, because these are way more important than the films we're releasing. This is historical material that will be, I think, of real value in the future. Okay. And to conclude, I want to thank everybody for coming today and remind you that on October 13th, we're going to be talking about Robert F. Kennedy right here in the same location. So thank you all very Completely much. different sort of talk. Yeah, very different. Thanks. Good job, my friend. <laughs>